Today we have uh, with us uh, Taryn Kali Halomo, a tax professional who's going to answer some questions for us having to do with uh, the implications of tax law and landlord tenant law. Um, Taryn, would you please uh, say a little bit about yourself? Well, sure. I have uh, been a tax professional specializing in small and medium sized businesses and their owners for over 20 years. And around 2010, uh, when the flippers became a thing, people got into buying and flipping and holding uh, real estate investments, um, I kind of shifted my focus and have been primarily concentrating on real estate investors, landlords, agents, and that sort of thing since then. So. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks. I appreciate you taking time out of your, your busy day to, to answer a few questions for us um, because we get a ton of them. And, and, you know, I'm not always qualified. You know, I'm not a tax attorney. And so some of these things uh, are, are a little bit out of my comfort zone. And so it's helpful to have somebody that, you know, I can go to with questions that, that I get that I, I just can't answer sometimes. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll dig right in. The, the first question that we have today has to do with whether or not a, a, an LLC should be set up as a sole proprietorship or as an S corp and, and what difference should, uh, should an investor or a property manager or an owner have to consider uh, with this particular question? Absolutely, and, so, and that's a great question. You know, people decide that they should um, incorporate to protect themselves legally, typically. It's a, it's a legal um, thing. And, and I strongly believe, Ernie, that we should stay in our lane. So I never give legal advice. Um, but uh, when it comes to setting up an entity, um, that's one piece. It's kind of the legal piece of it. And then the next thing is to determine how you're going to be taxed. Because on, opening that LLC is, you know, you register with the state, you create uh, agreements. And then um, the default to a single owner is a disregarded entity. It's an LLC taxed as a sole prop, or you know, taxed on your um, inside your your individual tax return. Um, the default with the IRS to a multi-owner uh, company would be a partnership. Those are the defaults, and you have to make elections to choose something different. Um, I believe that in most cases for landlords, when they own rental properties, whether it's you know residential or commercial, I think that the LLC tax as a disregarded entity is typically the best option for them, unless there's another owner, and we can get into that later. Um, the problem with S corps when it comes to rental properties is twofold. The number one thing that most people um, who decide to open an S corp aren't prepared for, don't understand, or um, think they can get around is that an S-Corp owner is required by the IRS to collect a reasonable salary that's reported to them on a W-2. So that opens up that you have to do payroll, okay? Um, the other thing is that S-Corp income is flow-through income that is subject to self-employment tax. So that's another layer of taxes that you're putting on yourself when you decide that you want an escort versus a disregarded entity or an LLC. Uh, rental property held in an LLC is a pass through and it just is reported on a what's called a Schedule E in your tax return. And um, that income is not subject to self-employment. I see, so it, it would be as though I didn't even have an LLC and I just purchased it under my name, but for legal liability, you get all the benefits of limited liability with the ease of a sole proprietorship. That's right. Okay. Well, let's say that, that I'm up for something a little more complicated and I've got um, a, a buyer or an owner who uh, wants to go in with one or more partners uh, and, and purchase property. What's, what's some, some good recommendations for a group of people who want to purchase property that they want to lease or, 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 or you know, manage? Okay. So the simplest thing is a situation like um, a sibling, a family member, mm -hmm. uh, a friend, a, a significant other that you want to purchase a property with. Um, the simplest thing to do in that case uh, is um, 
to just purchase the property. If you're doing a 50-50, let's just say 50-50 because that's simple for our example here. If you're going to 50-50 buy it, then you can 50-50 split out the expenses, the income and expenses and everything. And you can report that separately, your 50%, their 50% on their tax return, on your tax return, just like you did with the LLC pass-through. That's the simple way to do it. Um, and like I said, you know, the the default, if you created an LLC for that, the default is that that's a partnership. If there's more than one person, it defaults. You have to make an election to do something different. Um, in community property states like Texas, uh, you also have the option if you're purchasing that property with, with your spouse, you have the option of what's called a qualified joint venture. And you can have that inside your tax return without having to, to prepare a separate partnership tax return. That's only allowed if um, that partner is your spouse. You can do that. How would a how would a joint venture be any different than if you know my spouse my spouse and I just bought it uh, in our in our names as individuals? Well, as well the difference couple. there is if you did the LLC. If you don't do the LLC and you just purchase it, you personally purchased it, then yeah, you just put it on a schedule E. It's going to default to the taxpayer being the primary person on a tax return. It's going to default to that income and stuff going to that person. But um, the tax benefit is the same if you just do it that way. The difference there is that if you were to create the LLC and you put that property in the LLC and the owners are husband and wife, then you get to report it in the simple way, the tax return simple way. Very good. Okay. So uh, spouses, yes. Anybody else, you, you, you got a, a few more layers to, to get through. Sure. Got it. Okay. Well, I, you know, from time to time, I get questions about a 1031 exchange. And, and the truth is, it's not something that, that you know, I, I necessarily deal with in litigation, but it is something that comes up from property investors. And so what is it that, that investors or that that property managers should consider with a 1031 exchange? What are the benefits? What, what, what are the drawbacks from it, if any? Sure. Well, so the benefit is, um, I'll, I'll give an example of what I think is an ideal um, scenario for a 1031 exchange. Now, what makes it a 1031 exchange is that the person who owns the property and is selling the property, buying properties, never touches the money. Never. Once you've touched the money, you've broken your 1031 exchange, uh, which means you have to hire an, an, a mediator. You have to hire a, a um, mediator is not the correct word. An intermediate. <laughs> I'm stumbling on that word. You have to hire a, a company. You, you can go back. We can just cut all this out if, if you want to okay. take it back. Thank you. You have to hire a company that specializes in 1031 exchanges. Mm -hmm. And that company will um, kind of maneuver through that transaction for you. They'll be the ones to collect the money when you sell your property. They'll hold on to it in escrow and they will turn around and they will submit those funds to the purchasing party. You never personally touch the money. Okay. So um, the ideal situation would be, for example, uh, let's say that you own a property that you either inherited or purchased many years ago for a very small, you have a, a really low basis in that property, meaning your cost in that property is very low and you want to trade up. You want to buy a more expensive property in a nicer area that has higher rent, et cetera, et cetera. What you can do is you can, can um, kind of, you're basically delaying the capital gains on the property. You're delaying it. You're rolling those capital gains from that property into another property. And you're not going to have to pay any capital gains in this scenario. Um, where that becomes like, in my, my opinion, one of the best um, scenarios, one of the best outcomes of that is that you're going to constantly hold on to these properties. You may do another 1031 exchange and another one and another one. I have some clients that have done three or four on that original property and just keep trading up. Um, let's say they then pass away. Their intent is to never sell and not own a rental property. Their intent is to hold on to this to the day they die. On the day that they die, their heirs inherit this property at a stepped up basis. Their basis steps up to its 
current fair market value. So if that property originally was $50,000 in the 70s, you just keep trading up, trading up, trading up, and then you die in 2025. And that property that you currently are holding is worth half a million dollars. Nobody pays taxes. Nobody has paid any taxes on any of that gain from way back then to right now. And your heirs inherit it at the stepped up fair market value. If they sell it at that same time, they actually, because there's cost to sell a property, they will have a loss on their tax return, but they'll have a heck of a lot of money in their pocket. So it's ideally that's like the best way to have, you know, tax free money, if you will. Um, right. But if, if you break that chain at any point, then you your basis is at a certain level and you and oh, wow. So then yeah. if, if you can hold on to it and you can, like you said, trade up, you can avoid just just an ocean of taxes over. It sounds like decades, maybe. But but still, if that's your long term plan, um, then, yeah, that, that's that's one really good way to avoid it. And I guess why people talk about the 1031 exchange, especially if they, they, they know they purchased a property 10 years ago that has increased in value so significantly that it makes sense to hire this third party company to stand in the middle uh, and, and make the transaction happen. Absolutely. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. That's, that's good to know. I know a lot of, uh, I know a lot of investors and, uh, and landlords ask these types of questions. And so it's good to have a very clear explanation of, of when this works and why people actually do it. So uh, here's, here's one last thing that's on a lot of people's minds. And, you know, I've had people ask me, well, Ernie, I've had so many losses in unpaid rent from this year alone uh, due to the pandemic. Can I take that, these losses, in unpaid rent as a deduction on uh, on my taxes when I file next year? Yeah, so individuals by default are what we call cash basis taxpayers, okay? We pay taxes on the money we get in, you know, our paycheck that hits the bank every week and, you know, the things that we pay out. So we pay on a cash basis. So that means that you're, you record as income the cash that you receive in, that you deposit, and you record as deductions the expenses related to your rental properties that you pay out, right? right. So, so income in, let's say, you know, you, you are charging, you know, $1,000 a month and you have a property for 12 months, that's $12,000. If it was empty for, you know, two months of that, then you only received $10,000. You're only going to report $10,000. You're not going to report 12 and then have a loss of two to net out 10. Oh, it all comes out the same. So, so, so in effect, if the money never came in, they're not paying taxes on this money because they didn't actually get it, but they can't also say, because I could have gotten it, that constitutes a loss. Right, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now you can still, as long as that house was available to rent, mm -hmm. it, you know, either somebody was in it and not paying you rent or right. it was vacant, nobody was in it and you weren't collecting rent. You still are incurring holding costs. You're still incurring taxes, insurance, utilities, repairs, all of those things. You can still deduct all of those things. Mm -hmm. As long as the house is what we call in service, meaning available to rent or being rented, you can deduct those things. If you decided, however, like I had some, you know, Airbnb people that decided I'm not renting my house. You don't want squatters in your property. So I'm just not going to make it available to rent. So I don't have to deal with the squatters. Well, if you pull it off the market and it's not available to rent, it's not in service. You can't deduct anything. Mm. Kind of sucks. But, you know, so that's when it's really very beneficial to know what the laws are, what the Absolutely. squatters laws are, you know, is short term is okay. Long term is are they there more than 28 days? I mean, there's a lot of laws related to that, that you need to consider when you, when you make those decisions. Right. Okay. Well, Taryn, it's been great uh, having you here. I, I know you've given us a wealth of information. Tell us uh, how people can contact you if they have additional questions or perhaps need a tax professional to, to assist them in their business. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always here for questions. Um, you know, if it's a quick question, you just have a, a basic, you know, general question. 
email me, text me, call me. That's that's great. Um, if we have to get into specific issues related to your specific, you know, specific case, specific situation, you'll you'll know beforehand if you're going to get a bill from me. But the best way to reach me is um, it's Taryn at TarynTaxPro.com. So it's T-A-R-Y-N at T-A-R-Y-N TaxPro, P-R-O.com. Um, that's my uh, email. And my website, of course, is TarynTaxPro.com. And my telephone number is 214-226-5838. Great. I'm in the Dallas area, but I serve clients in 18 states and two other countries. So we're set oh. up to help anybody. Great, great. And we're going to put all of that information uh, on the bottom of the screen here for everybody uh, to uh, to be able to use. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining me and for all of uh, the information that you've given to, to me and, and to anybody watching. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, and for, for those of you who have watched and uh, continue to follow this channel, uh, thanks so much. Uh, I know that there are other videos that uh, YouTube uh, will link here to this video. And if you want to subscribe, if you haven't done that yet, please consider subscribing. But until next time, happy leasing.